The Need for Speed series in the 2000s was one of the most popular franchises not just in the racing genre but video games in general, reaching its peak with Most Wanted in 2005, with 16 million copies sold. Its pursuit system and daylight setting mixed with the import features from Underground made it a superb combination. But what goes up must come down, and gamers point to the next one as the beginning of the nosedive. It doesn't necessarily fall off a cliff, but it's the first in the series that led to questions over the quality and innovation. Like all Need for Speed predecessors, as soon as the latest one came out, developers Black Box were already at work on another follow-up. A direct sequel to Most Wanted, one thing the developers kept talking about when developing and promoting the game is the canyon setting, how dangerous it was making it the perfect place to settle battles, and how they brought in canyon races to match the experience in real life. It was one of the more popular street racing trends at the time, especially in the latest Fast and Furious movie, Tokyo Drift. They also talked about the prominence of crews and how they played a role in the career mode, allowing for multiple options, bonuses, and reputation levels are based on how much territory you claim by winning races. Once again, they released it a year after the predecessor, which meant developers were working warp speed to meet with the deadlines. But the hardest part, according to Von Fersen, was creating the PlayStation 3 port. Note that this was 2006, a period when a lot of third-party developers criticized the complexity of the system's process architecture. To do so with other systems is impressive in itself. He should be cleaning up his rep. And he's taking care of my business for me. He owes us. It was announced on July 2006 and it looked really nice. It was set at night again like the underground titles, the BMW M3 return, along with the diverse lineup of tuners, muscle cars and exotics. It looked like another solid outing. However, the demo initially created the kind of reception and confidence we expect from the Need for Speed games of this generation, thanks to its inconsistent frame rates. But nonetheless, Need for Speed Carbon was released for every single 6th and 7th generation console including handhelds, mobile and the PC. I grew up with the PlayStation 2 version but didn't think much of it. I got bored of it quite easily. It just didn't interest me and it's a relief I got it cheap to begin with. I wasn't what you call a patient gamer at the time, but I sort of felt the same way with Most Wanted, and after giving that a second chance for the review, it's now one of my favourite races of that generation despite the appalling rubber banding. I won't let it go, it's that bad. But anyway, would I have the same experience giving Carbon another chance? And to make sure I didn't feel limited in my experience, I very recently got a copy of the PlayStation 3 version which like Most Wanted on the 360 was a launch title. People pointed this game as the beginning of the EA recapulating series like they do with most franchises. But does it deserve that kind of rap now that it's been out for over a decade? Now I know there's a portable version called Own the City, but it's so different from the one I'm about to talk about it deserves its own review, at least until I figure out how to record PSP footage properly. After evading everyone in Rockport with the BMW M3 you won back from Razor, you are driving along the canyons approaching a new city to race on. However, an old foe is out for revenge. Oh, I wonder who that might be. Guess who's back? Nathan Cross, now a bounty hunter, totals the M3 after attempting to escape from him. I think after all that effort in Most Wanted, that feels like a bit of a slap in the face. How you been? It's time to settle a little score from Rockport. You think? But before he can arrest you, Darius arrives to pay off Cross, and Nikki isn't exactly pleased to see you. How dare you show your face here! Whoa, 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 hey, can you control yourself? It turns out that before the events of Most Wanted, you also raced in Palmerton, and the way you left it was certainly suspicious. During a race between the three territory leaders, the police ambushed the whole thing, which leads to everyone being arrested and you escaping out of town with the prize money. However, later on in the career mode, you realize there's a lot more to it than just a police sting. Why didn't you ever tell me about the missing money? Because in this game, I'm a mute. But either way, Nikki hooks you up with a new car, teaches you the basics of crew member abilities, which I'll get to, and Darius gives you the task of regaining control of the city and all its territories, with others joining you along the way and piecing together what really happened on that night. Bottom line is, the Heat had an agenda and you took the fall. Somebody interfered in a big way, and now you need a good crew to pick up the pieces. 
Since this flashback mystery happened in Palmerton and is never mentioned in Most Wanted, you don't need to play it to understand what's going on. Some video game stories can't do that properly, I'll give them credit for that. It also continues the cinematic green screen style of Most Wanted. It looks cleaner, and there are more cutscenes with each one unfolding a different perspective of what happened in that flashback as you progress. After looking at the bonus disc, you could tell they did their best. It certainly looks the part. It's aged surprisingly well, and they encourage you to win races, reach the top, and unlock faster cars to drive. But it's still highly predictable and full of cliché characters who won't take no for an answer, and without any development or history. And the acting? Why does Darius talk like he has his mouth open at all times? I mean, we already know from the beginning that he's the bad guy in all this. You just couldn't leave good enough alone, could you? We were making bundles of cash, you were clearing your name, what more could you want? They've used this formula since Underground, did you think I would be surprised? This might sound harsh because it's Need for Speed Carbon. It's not as well received as its predecessors which in hindsight have the same issues, but they took more of a back seat. They weren't as long and frequent which meant less distraction from the driving. It had just enough of it. Here, they focus too much on it. It also doesn't help that the rating classifications are similarly suitable for sim races, sports, or kids games. So you can't do much anyway. I'll even put up with this guy. Speaking of the predecessors, the city certainly looks familiar. The sun has set on Silverton. So you've been gone a while? You're out in Rockport, huh? Man, a lot has changed since you took off. I like that it's set at night again, going back to the colourful night lights while trying to continue the plot and themes from Most Wanted. A combination of San Diego, Los Angeles and San Francisco, it does look nice. I like the rainbow lighting, reflection effects, and if you're in the canyons, there are moments when the headlights are the only useful means of seeing what's ahead. It's like watching a HD port of underground with supercars added. The only downside is that because it's set at night, it doesn't look as sharp or detailed as most wanted. What they should have done is switch slowly between day and night like an open world, and this affects the level of police activity, certain events can only be accessed, the neon switches on during the night, etc. Missed opportunity right there. But that's what happens when you only have a year to develop a game during that period. The fact that they released it for all consoles from two generations brand new is eye-opening when you think about it. The only game I know that also did this was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 from 2001 to 2002. It looks like they put most of their focus on the 7th gen consoles this time, because there are a couple of exclusive editions, like the in-game cutscenes for example, and the Wii version utilizes motion controls. I haven't played that version yet, but given that the critic scores are the lowest, they might not be that good. Although Most Wanted came out for the Xbox 360, Carbon gives you a perfect idea of how much the 7th generation has advanced graphically from the previous one. The PS3, Xbox 360 and PC versions run ring around the other one, but gameplay wise from my experience they're pretty much the same. First place, buddy, that's you. Nearly all the events in Most Wanted return in Carbon, Circuit, Sprint, Speed Trap and Toll Booths, which are renamed checkpoints but there's no risk of attracting police attention, which I'll also get to. But what happened to the drag races? I don't understand why events are taken out, is it a memory reason? Like they can't fit all previous events onto one game? It turns out the focus is on the canyons. It's where all the scores are settled and police aren't in sight, it's just Sprint down a steeper hill, and you can't access it when free roaming. But one one big event that was omitted from Most Wanted and Returns is Drifting, which is one of the easiest events of the entire Need for Speed series. There, I've said it. Seriously, they're incredibly easy, it's kind of insulting. These take place on either a closed circuit or the canyons, but it's easier because unlike Underground where you have an ongoing combo, hit a barrier or vehicle, it doesn't count. In Carbon, hitting something just ends the combo, and you can even skin the edges and continue gathering points. Sure, the canyons have breakable barriers which can end your run instantly, but look at the points tally on my first try. That sums it up perfectly. Each turf has at least two to three events, and you claim it by winning more than half of them. It's a good feeling knowing these crews with their try-hard attitude were beaten by a green and purple rooster. Just imagine how embarrassing it is for them. Went from being dominated to dominating. This town belongs to Color Shed now, baby. I let you win.
However, territories can also be under attack by other small crews and you need to win the race again to put them in their place. You'd think because we own the territory we'd start on pole, but no I guess. The city hates us. Go back where you came from. After clearing all the territory on a suburb, city area, the leader will race you on a circuit. Then after winning that, the battle will be taken into the canyons where the objective is to stay on the tail of the opponent as much as possible. The closer you are, the more points you get. Then after the heat is over, the opponent is now tailing you. The closer he or she is, the more points you lose. And if you can reach the finish line before that number hits zero, you win. And that suburb belongs to your crew. Note that nitrous oxide tanks are empty here, so you can't just blasted after a corner to get out of a dangerous situation. And like the drift event, the barriers are breakable, so be careful. So you need to think you're possessed to win these. It's not as frustrating as the critics mentioned, maybe I'm just lucky because every boss battle I completed in one go, but with that said, I wait until I've tuned my car as much as possible, to have the best chance because rubber banding fortunately isn't as bad as most wanted, but I'll get to that as well. If there's one thing the developers try to emulate from Midnight Club, it's how annoying the boss drivers are. Because every single time you either hit a barrier or car, even if you're more than 10 seconds ahead, they'll appear on the corner and mock you. <laughs> eh, shut up. Or maybe that is the reason why they're there. To put you off during races, because it's more distracting than it sounds. That's one thing I can say about the boss characters, they're easy to hate. The game controls as you'd expect from a Need for Speed game. Arcade racer, easy to pick up and play with multiple cars and their own stats. If there's one thing they shouldn't change is the driving mechanics. Nothing seriously wrong with it and it's one of the best things the developers did right. However, one thing I noticed after half an hour of gameplay is how much slower it is and not just because of the first car. The gameplay speed is slower in general compared to Most Wanted and the handling is more sensitive. I don't know if it has to do with me going from an Xbox 360 to a PlayStation 3 controller. That's how it feels, the tires love to make noise. But by the time you reach the final part of the map and unlock top level cars like this Lamborghini Gallardo for example, it fixes most of these issues apart from the tire squeal. Maybe it is the car, or the map barely having any straight roads. I don't know, most wanted had a bit of burnout inspiration about it. One thing you might notice compared to the predecessors is the number of cars on the road. There are more than four, and most of them share the same look. Well that's because they're part of a crew, like a racing team in motorsports. And you're leading your own, so you're not alone. As you progress through the career mode, drivers will offer their services and can join you in a race with their own special abilities to help you. The blocker takes out opponents on the track, the drafter gives you a slipstream boost, especially handy during speed trap events, and my favourite, the scout who finds all the shortcuts. They also have unique abilities off the road, so winning a race unlocks certain bonuses like additional prize money, heat not increasing after a race, discounts for parts, etc. You can only have three members at a time, and can hire new ones, fire others, but the reality is that everyone's part of the crew and you get to decide which bonuses you want to utilize. Because once you fire one, you can rehire them. Come to think of it, even your crew member during a race never shuts up. But at least they're supportive. Like the scouts, they'll always let you know about a shortcut ahead with a chance to take it. While this crew member teamwork feature is a neat idea, it makes the game too easy. Because if a crew member wins the race, it's just as beneficial as you winning. Like it counts as a completed event. And the rubber banding is almost as blatantly obvious as most wanted. Except it mostly works heavily in your favour this time. 
Because scouts like to find shortcuts, they always seem to get in front of other drivers to help guide you. They somehow get in front quickly. Look at this. Sal gets stuck at the beginning trying to go through the shortcut. Then at the end of the same lap, he's right behind me again. It's hard to describe, but if you have Sal in the races with you, it's almost impossible to lose. And that's why, as you can tell from the gameplay, he's in a lot of the races. And if you narrow it down, there are only 6 event types in this game. That's not enough, and it can feel quite dull if you play it for a long time, especially with these crew members. So it's not as infuriating, but they made it easy to the point where it feels equally unrewarding. Apart from the canyon duels when the crew members are absent, coincidentally. I was able to beat Most Wanted without the on-race assistant. Why have them now? That's a serious question to ask. How do you balance the difficulty so that it's not too easy or hard? I think they should just make the performance of cars almost equal. An option to have no crew members during a race, like that'll earn you more money. Or simply have difficulty options. You got a kid. I always said you did. Now the others are starting to believe too. Don't give up now, you're close. But at least if you decide to take a break from the career mode and try out other game modes like single race, time trial, etc, crew members are only optional. And one thing I forgot to mention in my most wanted review which is also in Carbon is the challenge series, sort of like career mode but full of driving missions where the story doesn't factor into the equation. It's almost like Need for Speed in the 90s again. Around 80% of cars from Most Wanted return, with the other 20% being replaced with more exotics and muscle cars, including the Alfa Romeo Brera, Shelby Mustang GT500, and many Dodgers. And if you get the Collector's Edition, you also get a Jaguar XK and Koenigsegg CCX, to name a couple. But the one that stands out is the Audi Le Mans Quattro, which we now know as the R8. How did Darius get his hands on one of those? That's shady. There are three car levels which have vastly different performance options. So instead of unlocking all the parts for your first car, only certain models can be fitted with better performance upgrades. So you need to keep changing wheels to progress through career mode. The customization options continue to grow with a lot of what was in Most Wanted and more. As you can tell from the career mode, I've mostly stuck with green, blue, purple and cyan. And the pre-made options look very impressive. Like Underground, you can place more than one layer of vinyls including full body ones. But what's finally introduced to the series is being able to move and reshape the vinyl to your desired position, which increases the number of creative opportunities. And if you complete some of the challenges, you unlock even more options. Unfortunately, the controls are limited in some areas. The time it takes to place the vinyl where you want it, I could beat the game in that time. Even Forza Motorsport on the original Xbox wasn't this slow. Whatever you do on one side, you can't duplicate on the other. This is why I don't bother with sponsor decals this time. And you can't view the car roof in its entirety. See that? That's as high as the camera goes. Fortunately, the pre-made ones are placed in the best possible spot, so it's not as tedious as it looks. Also new to the series is auto sculpting, which allows you to alter the body of the car on individual areas like the roof, body kits, and ride height, as well as fine tune the performance like in Underground 2. Cool but I was able to beat it with everything in the middle. And note that these little tuning details along with the auto sculpt and movable visuals can only be done in career mode if you have the right crew members who have the ability to do so, including mechanic, fixer, and fabricator. One of the few reasons to be strategic with the crew members you choose. I know all the back streets. I grew up in these alleys. I can customize anything. Even crew members' vehicles can be customized, although you can't change the body kit or vinyls. But at least whatever you customize, it doesn't cost anything. I love the customization options available, and I was able to once again design some sick looking wheels. At least I think they look sick. But it feels like wasted potential because as deep as it is, the only purpose they serve is to remove the heat from the police. Like you could change the color on the car and the vinyls, and then the body kit. Gameplay wise, it would have the same effect. What I'm saying is, program it so that you have to explore all the customizable options in order to progress through the career mode, like a different version of the Underground Star rating. And sticking with the police, the pursuit system is almost identical to Most Wanted, so I'll only be brief. If you're spotted by the cops, they'll give chase and you need to lose them by staying out of their sights and off the radar for a certain period of time. There are breakable structures to knock down, special cooldown spots to evade faster, and the more heat you generate, the harder it will be to lose them next time you're spotted. 
so you need to change the car's looks to reduce the heat. Each turf has their own levels of heat, like minimum and maximum in Most Wanted, and it's until you reach the final part of the map when they increase their invisibility. However, the biggest throw missions from Carbon are bounty-based missions. Like, there's literally no reason to cause as much chaos as possible. I get that story-wise, you're not trying to be the Most Wanted in Palmerton, but these missions were awesome. The highlight of Most Wanted. What a shame. But at least among the aforementioned challenge series, pursuit based ones are available, so there's your consolation. I thought there would be some sort of twist, but nope. Which means you could potentially beat this game without reaching heat level 2 on your car. I think I reached level 3 once or twice, and never got busted. Which gives you a good idea of how much you can stay under the radar in this game. And another reason why the customization feature is almost a waste, you don't need to change it around as often. And because all customization areas are in safe houses with the car lot being the only separate building on the map, and even then you can jump straight to it in the menus, the only time you really free roam is when you find the first safe house or if somebody wants to join your crew. That's it. Also, I kept Neville as a crew member the whole time. He has a bonus where he doesn't go up after a race. Hey, come on, that's not fair. Call the latter an example of stars aligning, but as a result, with everything else I criticize, no matter what version you have, it significantly reduces gameplay time. Most Wanted took around 12 hours to beat, but Carbon took close to 8 hours, if that. The event count is similar to Most Wanted. There are 2 to 3 events per territory with a combined total of 66 on the map. However, the actual races are much shorter, like every single circuit race only goes for 2 laps. It takes around 10 to 15 minutes longer to reach and beat a boss than a Blacklist member in Most Wanted, but there are 15 of them, whereas in Carbon there are only 4. And if you combine the small reliance on the pursuit system, jumping straight to everything including shops and safe houses, drift events having less restrictions, and crew members in a league of their own, everything adds up. I confess, this game is better than I thought, at least now that I'm playing it on the PlayStation 3. And I'm glad I finally beat it after my PS2 copy was left in the abyss for over a decade. It looks really vibrant, the driving mechanics are easy to comprehend even if it feels slower, customization options are bigger, and I like the idea of winning races to take over territories. They changed enough small details for me to create a decent sized review, but not enough to get that same level of excitement as most wanted. The only unique feature is the crew member system, and all it does is make the game easier, not better. And the canyon based racing was already technically in Underground 2, although the duels are enjoyable. Imagine what this game would have looked like if the developers had another year and it was only released for the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and PC. They changed the wrong things and comes across as an early example of an EA iteration where developing a game every year eventually takes its toll and gamers see through it. <laughs> Greed's always been your problem. But at least it's nothing compared to to what the series looks like now with its microtransactions, always on DRM, multiple editions and loot boxes. That's why I still kind of like it despite its unoriginality. The sales numbers spoke for themselves with over 6 million copies sold across all platforms. Still very successful commercially, but a huge drop off from Most Wanted which sold around 16 million copies. And I didn't buy another Need for Speed game until a few years later, which was Shift when I got a PlayStation 3, which was pretty good, but that's the latest in the series in my collection at the moment because I just lost interest. I didn't want to buy a Need for Speed game every year and there were other racing titles more interesting to me. It makes more sense to get any of the predecessors instead. 